On the first day, she sadly packed her belongings into boxes. On the second day, she had the movers come and collect her things. On the third day, she sat down for the last time at their dining room table and feasted on shrimp, a jar of caviar, and a bottle of spring water. When finished, she went into each room and deposited a few half-eaten shrimps dipped in caviar into the hollow center of the curtain rods. Then she left. On the fourth day, the husband came back with his new girlfriend, and at first all was bliss. Then slowly the house began to smell. They tried everything, cleaning, mopping, and airing out. Nothing worked. Finally, they couldn't take the stench any longer and decided they had to move. But a month later, even though they'd cut their price in half, they couldn't find a buyer for such a stinky house. Then the ex called and said that she missed her old home and would be willing to take a slightly reduced settlement in exchange for having the house at a, at a decent price. Knowing she could have no idea how bad the smell really was, he agreed on a price that was only one-tenth of what the house had been worth. A week later, the man and his girlfriend stood smiling as they watched the moving company pack everything to take to their new home. And to spite the ex-wife, they even took the curtain rods. <laughs> Don't you love a story with a happy ending? So today, uh, we're in a sermon series in 1 Peter called Keys of the Kingdom. And today, we're going to talk about how to deal with difficult people. And there's a lot of sources to come by difficult people. Could be an ex, uh, could be a current marriage partner, could be a neighbor. Sometimes people get involved in neighbor wars or a workmate, a boss, an employee, fellow student. But in any case, Peter addresses this in 1 Peter chapter 3. And we're going to look at it really under four headings. There's, there's two things not to do and two things to do. Okay, so two don'ts and two do's of dealing with difficult people today. How to deal with difficult people. First of all, don't be one, right? Don't be one. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Finally, finally, all of you, gosh, can we get the lights up a little bit? I can't even read. I have to read it off the screen. Finally, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, and be compassionate and humble. Could you find a better description here of a non-difficult person? I mean, if we break this down, you've got like-minded. That means to kind of to be in agreement. Uh, in a church, you're going to have different opinions on different things. But the main point is, well, it's like, what's going on back there? People are going crazy. All right, be like-minded. is. I may have an opinion, but I don't have to think, well, my opinion is always the right one. And I'm at odds with those who have a different opinion. Just somebody plays well in the sandbox, right? We understand what that means. Being sympathetic. Sympathetic literally means to suffer with someone. We're able to cry with those who cry, weep with those who weep. The word for love here, love one another, probably familiar with the word agape. If you've been in churches for any length of time, that's the love that we're to have for all people. That's not this word. This word is phileo. So you recognize that in Philadelphia. Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love brotherly love. And that's what kind of love phileo is. And these verses apply primarily to folks in the church. We're to have a brotherly love for one another, a really a relationship like a brother or a sister. Then you've got the description of compassionate, compassionate. This comes from two words in the original blended together, the word for good and the word for bowels or guts, because in the ancient world, they felt this is where the emotions resided. You know how you feel things in your gut? Whereas we talk about the heart, so they would talk about the gut. So this word means good guts. And to be compassionate, that is used of Jesus often in the Gospels. Jesus had compassion on them. Kyle Eidelman, in his study on 1 Peter, points out that often that word with Jesus, when you read the word compassion, it's followed by the word and. So he had compassion on them and he healed them. Or he had compassion on them and he reached out and touched her. Or he had compassion on them and he said, don't cry. Often the word and because compassion leads to an action or a word of compassion and sympathy for someone else. And then to be humble, finally, is the ability to look at others as more important than yourselves. If we have these qualities, like-minded, sympathetic, loving, compassionate, and humble, we're less likely to be a difficult person and therefore to bring difficult people into our lives. So sometimes problem people attract problem people. 
I mean, we find that in our marriage and in our job and where we go to school and even in the church, we're always dealing with difficult people. We may want to look in the mirror. That's not always the case, but it often is the case. Luke chapter 6, verse 38, Jesus said, If you give to others, you will be given a full amount in return. It will be packed down, shaken together, spilling over into your lap. The way you treat others is the way you will be treated. That's a general principle. I know there are exceptions. You might be thinking of exceptions right now. Well, I treat people that way, and I know this. I know there are exceptions, but that's in general. One of the jobs that I've had outside the ministry, uh, I was a rental car agent at Alamo Rental Car. Uh, at, at this time, there was a huge Alamo at Orlando International Airport. It was, it was off-site, but at the time, it was the largest rental car agency in the world because everybody flying into Orlando renting cars. We rental agents each had to take a turn at the customer service desk. And that's where people came when they had problems, usually some kind of problem with the rental agreement. I'll just give you, for instance, when you sign a rental agreement back then, you agreed to bring the rental car back with a full tank of gas. I don't know if it's still that way. It's been a while for me. But you got to bring it back with a full tank of gas. If Alamo has to fill it up, they charge an exorbitant amount of money for each gallon of gas. So some people, they, they got caught by surprise, so they would come into customer service. Can I, can I get a little understanding here? Can you cut this charge back? That's just one example of the kind of problem. As a rental car agent, I was authorized to give a refund up to a certain amount. But if it was over that amount, I had to go get a manager. Now, time and time again, I would go get a manager. We're coming back. She would ask me, what's the problem? I would describe the problem. And then she would ask me this. Now, is the customer being nice about it or are they being a jerk? And the way I answered that question, nine times out of 10, determined whether or not that customer got satisfaction or not, whether they got grace or they got the law. And if I said they're being a jerk, nope, not, nothing for you. If I said, yeah, they're being, they're being nice about it, a lot of times they, they would get relief from that charge. Isn't that the way it works so much in life? Some people think, well, I'm a jerk and I'll be this way. I'll get what I want. Well, maybe one or two times. But most often, it's just like Jesus said, the way you treat others is the way you will be treated. So dealing with difficult people, number one, don't be one. Number two, don't retaliate. Don't retaliate. Verse nine, first part of the verse, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. So no revenge, no payback. If somebody insults me, I'm not, I don't top their insult with one of my own. It's a great example of this. And by the way, this is the consistent teaching of the New Testament. Jesus said in Matthew 5, turn the other cheek. Paul writes in Romans 12, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. And again, in 1 Thessalonians 5, see that no one repays another with evil for evil. You've heard of Samson. Samson in the Old Testament, one of the judges in the book of Judges, a leader of the people of Israel, he's known for his great strength. But he could have just as well been known for his attitude of retaliation and revenge. Hypersensitive, so easy to insult. And then he's going to give back as good as he gets. Early on in his life, he was engaged to be married to a Philistine woman. He goes to Philistia for the wedding. They have a big wedding party. Everything's all set to go. He has an argument with his fiancée, leaves her standing at the altar. He goes home to mom and dad. A few months later, he cools off. He's going to go back. He's going to make up. So he brings a goat kind of as a peace offering. I mean, today it might be flowers and candy. Back then it was the goat. He's going to make up with his wife. He gets back to Philistia only to find out they had decided, hey, we got a preacher here. We got the temple all rented out. Let's go ahead and have a wedding. And his fiance had married the best man. Well, Samson's not going to let that lie. So in order to get revenge, he burned down the wheat fields and the vineyards of the Philistines. Well, the Philistines can't have that. So they're getting revenge back on Samson. So they burned down his fiance and his father-in-law. They burned them to death. Well, Samson's going to get retaliation and revenge for that. And so he takes the jawbone of a donkey and he kills three or kills 1,000 Philistines. The Philistines can't let that go. 
And so not long afterwards is when they capture Samson, they put out his eyes with red hot pokers and make him a slave. And then finally, at the very end, Samson is in one of their pagan temples and he says, Lord, let me get revenge. And he pulls down the pillars and kills thousands of Philistines and himself in the process. It's just a story of revenge. Now, let me show you four verses here from Judges. These are all things that Samson said. And it really illustrates the juvenile attitude of payback and revenge. The first three are from chapter 15, verse 3. Samson says, this time I have a right to get even with the Philistines. I will really harm them. Verse 7, since you acted like this, I won't stop until I get my revenge on you. Verse 11, I merely did to them what they did to me. And then 16, 28, let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. That whole attitude of revenge and payback diminished the influence of Samson's ministry. It could have been so much more. And at the end, it destroyed him. And it always does. Revenge always destroys us. So that's probably not much of a problem here, but it's just one of the don'ts from dealing with difficult people. Don't be one and don't retaliate. Don't seek to get revenge. What a relief it is. What a relief when we realize that we don't have to make sure other people get what's coming to them in this life or make sure that we get what's coming to us. That's outside of our wheelhouse. It's outside of our pay grade. That's God's business. It's not that it's not going to happen. God will make sure it happens, but he's the only one qualified to do that. We just don't have to worry about it. It's off the table for a Christian. All right, that's the two don'ts. Now let's look at the two do's. The first two do is do be a blessing. Do be a blessing. The latter part of verse 9. On the contrary, repay evil with a blessing. Now I don't know how many people practice non-retaliation like we were just talking about. I think it's probably a lot especially a lot of Christians. We understand that. We get that. I'm not going to pay back. I'm not going to seek revenge. I'm not going to try to retaliate. But this one right here, this be a blessing, isn't that taking non-retaliation to a whole nother level? Not only am I going to practice self-control and not retaliate, but I'm going to be proactive and return a blessing if someone insults me or does something evil against me. I'm going to give them a blessing. I think that it may be a minority who actually strive to practice this. And what are we talking about when we say a blessing? Give them a blessing. That's either a word or an action of goodness towards someone else. A kind word, a good word, an encouraging word, a soft answer, so to speak, as the Proverbs say, to turn away wrath. Oh, I'm sorry you feel that way. Uh, why don't we pray about this? Let's pray that we both do better. I'll try to understand. I'll try to do better. Just a soft answer by word or an action that is a blessing toward that person. In Luke chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus says, Love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for He is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Let's talk about this in the context of marriage for a moment. Now, if you were with us last week in this sermon series, just in the previous verses, it was called the marriage key, and we were looking about what Peter taught in regards to marriage. I find it interesting that the verses that immediately follow that are how to deal with difficult people. Sometimes, you know, like we said, a difficult person can be a neighbor, it could be a co-worker, it could be a fellow student. A church member, but it also could involve marriage from time to time. That can be difficult. Not necessarily because we're married to a particularly difficult person, could be, but not necessarily, but that the person we live with, whether it's a parent, a child, you know, grown children, or whoever's in the same household, that's, that's who we see the closest. That's who we know the best. And the closer you are to someone, well, the more you can see their flaws and shortcomings. I mean, that's why those folks on TV and in the movies and on Facebook, they look so attractive and so appealing because we only see them from a distance. God forbid that we should ever have to live with any of those people. 
But in any case, so let's say that, you know, the person that we live with might be difficult sometimes. Well, we can put that into practice. This right here, be a blessing. One of the books that I recommended last Sunday on marriage, um, there was You and Me Forever by Francis and Lisa Chan, and there was A Lifelong Love, you know, the books that you all rushed out and bought last week. I think this came from one of those two books. It's called A Monk's Marriage. Now, I'm going to read it the way the author wrote it. What if I sought a monk's marriage? Well, the monks don't get married. Yeah, so what if I decided that I would depend on God alone, expecting nothing from my spouse, but depending entirely on God for all my needs, including emotional and relational needs? Then instead of resenting what my spouse doesn't do, I'll be overwhelmed in a good way by every little thing he or she does do. I'll be filled with gratitude instead of resentment. After all, Jesus said, if you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Receiving love is a beautiful result of loving others. But the pure joy of love comes first from having a loving attitude, no matter what I get in return. Remember Jesus said, expecting nothing in return. God models this truth about love. Jesus said, God sends his reign on the just and the unjust alike. The Bible says that while we were sinners and enemies of God out of love, he sent his son Jesus to die for our salvation. Most people do not and will not return the love of God. That's a fact. Is it the majority or the minority who will be saved? This is a minority. Narrow is the gate and few are those who find the path to the kingdom of God. But God loves them anyway. Love can never be demanded. It can only be given. It doesn't work to run around shouting, love me, love me. You have to love me. Or submit to me, submit to me. Or honor me, respect me. You have to. That doesn't work. But ironically, when we do focus our efforts on giving love to others, that's when we ratchet up the odds that we will also receive love in this life. It's the old law of reciprocation that God has built into his universe. We reap what we sow. The way you treat others is the way you will be treated. Now, that's not necessarily the goal, but it's a side benefit of being a blessing to others. Now, let me say something. I, I can just look out and, and tell those of you who are married, you're married to wonderful people, and this isn't the case. I'm really talking to those who are online, and I get that today, live streaming. <laughs> but if you happen to be married to someone who's particularly difficult, what an opportunity. What an opportunity to allow God to grow within us. Love, patience, grace toward another person. What an opportunity to model what God and Jesus do for us, to be a blessing to another person. I'm not talking about an abusive relationship. I'll qualify that right now. Anybody who's in an abusive relationship, get out, get out. So I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying with a particularly difficult person. And someone may say, but that's not fair. I would agree with that. I don't think it's necessarily fair. But we're Christians. We're not people of fair. We're people of grace. And you know what grace means? I'll give you two definitions. One, grace is treating someone better than they deserve to be treated. That's a good definition, but I prefer this one. Grace is treating someone the opposite of how they deserve to be treated. The opposite. That's how God treated us. See, God gave us what Jesus had earned and what he deserved. He gave us sonship and life. And then God gave Jesus what we had earned and what we had deserved, punishment. Right? Grace is treating someone the exact opposite of how they deserve to be treated. But we understand that. We understand that. So whether it's in marriage or just someone we happen to be sharing a home with, you know, parents, like I said, and adult children, or whether it's that fellow student or a co-worker, boss, employee, whether it's that difficult neighbor, we seek to repay evil with a blessing. Be a blessing. And then the fourth part here is seek a blessing. Seek the blessing. The latter part of verse 9 through verse 12. 
repay evil with a blessing because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, someone may think that's never going to work. I mean, we all need love in our lives. We need a blessing in our lives. If I'm constantly giving, 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 and never receiving, you know, I'm, I'm going to burn out. That's, that's not even possible. It's not realistic. Well, that's not really what Peter is saying right here. He's saying by living this way and returning a blessing, even to those who are not being nice or respectful or honoring or loving toward us, we are seeking our blessing primarily from God. It's not that we do without a blessing. It's that we seek that blessing from God. We are inheriting the blessing. And to this we were called. Picture a man and a woman, let's say a husband and a wife, and they're underwater and they're 40 feet down and they got an oxygen tank, but one oxygen tank and one oxygen mask. And to survive, they've got to share that mask back and forth. I take a breath. She takes a breath. I take a breath. She takes a breath. What happens? They're fighting for the oxygen. They're constantly fighting for the oxygen. And if I look at that relationship, maybe a marriage relationship, maybe a friendship, maybe a church member somewhere else, as my primary source of love and blessing, then it's give me, give me, give me. No, you give me, you give me, you give me. Constantly fighting over the oxygen. What they need is another tank. They need an independent source of oxygen or blessing. I was talking to a wife a couple of weeks ago who gets this. She said, I told my husband at one point, you're off the hook. Because I received my primary source of love and joy and completeness, completeness, not from you, but from God. She receives that for her husband, that's just gravy. But her primary source is from God, and that's what we're saying. That's what Peter is saying here. That's what's healthy in a relationship. My primary source of blessing is from God that I'm free to give and to give and to give. And we don't have to fight over the oxygen. He who would love life and see good days. I don't know if you saw Fiddler on the Roof, but there's a song in there called Lachaim. Lachaim to life, to life, Lachaim. Uh, I like it. It's got some good man dancing in it. And aside from the copious references to drinking alcohol, I know it's a drinking song, but it's got a good line where they say, God expects us to be joyful even when our hearts lie panting on the floor. How much better to be grateful when there's really something to be grateful for? And Christians of all people know there's really something to be grateful for. We love life in the sense that we are living a life that is worthy of living. Not like the author of Ecclesiastes who said, I hate my life. Everything is meaningless. No, for the Christian, everything is meaningful. And we love life. We know we have the ultimate blessing of living with God in heaven, new heavens and the new earth. He who would love life and see good days. What does it mean to see a good day? Often we say, have a good day. What do we mean by that? How can we have a good day if I've got a migraine headache, if I've received news of the death of a loved one, or if I've received a dire medical diagnosis? How can I have a good day or good days if my circumstances are not conducive to that? For a Christian, every day can be a good day because we know through Jesus Christ, we have the victory over these kinds of enemies in our lives eventually. We love life and see good days because we inherit our blessing and our blessing comes from God. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. Here's another older movie. Some of you may remember Casablanca. And in Casablanca, there's one point where Rick says to Ilsa, Here's looking at you, what? Kid, here's looking at you, kid. As he gazes at her with love and adoration in his eyes. 
The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous in that way. I want you to imagine God saying this to you. Here's looking at you, kid. I love you. I adore you. No, this whole business of righteousness. There is a sense in which our righteousness is just the righteousness of Christ. That's, that's what's going to save us and get us into heaven. Not what we do and not our good work, so to speak. But there's another sense of relative righteousness. What Peter is teaching here is if we are this kind of person who is like-minded and sympathetic and loving and compassionate, we don't retaliate and we return a blessing for evil if we're pursuing righteousness in that way. Those are the good works that he's referencing then we're going to have the eyes of the Lord upon us to listen to our prayers and to bless us. In order to live the blessing, we must be seeking righteousness in our lives. So y'all be good now. You hear? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, uh, everybody at some point has a difficult person in their life. And maybe it could be relationships that go on for a long, long time. We pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit, we can call upon him to be producing these kinds of attitudes within us of love and joy, of peace and patience, kindness, of goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control so that we can go and be a blessing to others and receive that special blessing that you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.